So the next session will be presented by Stelian Mokanita, who is living currently in Germany and has been working in web development for eight years, tracking projects of different shapes and sizes for customers such as Marlboro, Sprint Telecom, and different governmental institutions. Three years ago, he has joined Rakuten in Germany, and he leads the development team there. And as I can see, he's really happy about that. <laughs> On top of development, he's also wearing a DevOps hat, so he's also responsible for platform stability and performance at the company. And without any further ado, I present Stilan. Hello. So, um, we probably should make this short because you guys have the closing keynote and stuff. So, that's the talk. It's about taming your application with logging and monitoring. And it's pretty much what we can do from an engineer perspective to ensure a little bit of sanity. So, about me. I am a development manager at Rockton. Um, I obviously worked on all sorts of projects of different sizes. Right now I do enterprise PHP for whatever that worth. Um, and obviously I do operations from time to time and the, the sad news is there at the bottom, I'm married to a QA, so I fall asleep with books like how to break software. That's nice. So um, that's the company I work for. I don't want to advertise it in any way, but it's relevant because as you can see, we have all the services across the world and they communicate to one another, so obviously we need to do logging and monitoring. But that's pretty much it about the company, nobody cares. Uh, let's get back to me. So um, I'm a Unix guy. I really, really like Unix. So, and one of the things that intrigued me about it is process handling, right? So I was like, okay, we've got processes, we've got forks, you can fork a process, but can you fork two processes at, at once? Um, it's more complicated than you actually think, so I enlisted the help of my wife. We worked together on that a little while. The implementation was rather short, but do you want to see what we came up with? That, <laughs> right? For those that you do not know, that's a baby, yeah. Now babies, they're, they're interesting creatures, but let me tell you a little story. When this thing was like three uh, weeks old, I woke up in the middle of the night, I took my laptop and I started looking at the dashboard of our logging and monitoring. It took me roughly five minutes to figure out that I actually woke up because the baby was crying and there was no alert. So from that point of view, I kind of figured out, well, you know, babies do actually train you for monitoring and alerting, right? And monitoring, what is it all about? At bottom line, it's basically just a bunch of automation scripts that uh, kind of give you the current state of your system. It's fairly, fairly... Um, complex if you want to set it up by yourself, so don't do it. If you do not have an operations team, just go for something enterprise. It's actually cheaper. But it comes with a lot of tools out there. So like you have Nagios, people found glitches with it, so they forked it to Isinga, they, and they found another glitch with it. Um, but my personal favorite, anybody cares to guess? No? This one, that's Twitter. That, that's really good for uh, monitoring. Every now and then you'll see something like this. Hey, can you start up? Nice project and all, but it kind of doesn't work. So, now don't laugh. Twitter is legit. Um, and to prove it, I made a graph. Um, apparently, it's very, very cost efficient. You have no infrastructure. You, ha you don't have to do anything, basically. In terms of escalation time, is kind of around there because, you know, not everybody tweets about your fuck-ups. Reliability, pretty up there, nobody trolls about startups. But the advantage of working in a really big company is that you have a PR department. So I don't know a lot about PR, but I went to them and I was like, guys, if this happens, is it good or bad? And they were like, well, you know how they say any advertising is some advertising? Not the case. So in PR and professional, not the biggest sellers. Overall, still a decent solution, uh, but you can do better. And the thing is that I'm not here to talk to you about how to set up Nagios. I'm here to talk to you about what you can actually do um, from the developer's perspective. 
So part of the monitoring is actually your job. And something that we all like as developers is documentation, right? Yeah, there we go. So unfortunately, you do have to do some documentation work um, about what your application does. And um, I had a chat with a developer, and he said, what do you mean document what my application does? It's a shop. You go, you pick a product, put it in the cargo to check out. That's what it does. Well, that's not relevant for ops. They need to understand how the information flows, like from the, uh, the moment the user goes to your website until you actually serve a request. Now, nowadays applications got way bigger. It used to be a um, small PHP script in somebody's basement or in a shared hosting. It's not the case anymore. We have distributed systems. We have also all sorts of virtualization things. So it's really, really important that you uh, get that right. And it's also important to um, train your operations team on how does the application fail. Um, and the immediate response is, well, if I knew how it fails, I would fix it, which is not always the case because there might be um, things that are out of your control, like network outages, like you cannot connect to your Redis cluster. What happens then? How should your operations team handle that? Or what happens when our trusted third-party vendors fail? So all those things you kind of need to document so people actually know what to do with it. Again, distributed system. A lot of nodes, a lot of clusters, a lot of things. Operations need to understand how data flows through your application so they can do a good job at it. If not, they're always going to call you in. And the purpose is to train them on how to restore the application. So the end result would be uh, that they don't need to call you. Whenever a problem arises, um, they just basically know what to do. Another thing that you can do as an engineer is help with defining the metrics. Now, these metrics come in two different shades and colors. One of them is the work metrics. That's basically what's kind of relevant to business. And as a free tip, if you have, who here has this project key kickoff meeting? Oh, a lot of people. Okay, if you guys want to look good, just ask about these. It's like, what's relevant for the business? What should we monitor? It always gets them on. So um, this can be customer accounts. This is relevant, how many customers you have. And it can actually be how much money does your app make, right? That, that's important. The other uh, kind of uh, metrics, it's resource metrics. So it's about how much RAM or CPU or whatever uh, thing you're using. And is 90% IO acceptable? Now, ops monitor this thing, so they can see like you're reaching out um, on the RAM limit or your CPUs are fairly loaded, but they cannot assess if that's actually something worth looking into. So you need to give them this information. And also important about metrics is that you need to revisit them. When you start your business and you monitor customer accounts, three per hour is amazing. That means you still have a job. Um, after one year, if the same monitoring applies, that means you do not have a job. Like, look at the sponsors he was hiring, go that way. Um, another thing you can do is basically define um, a working state of your application. What does this mean? Well, first off, you have this ping endpoint or heartbeat. Um, we work a lot in distributed teams all across the world, and we share each other's services. Uh, it's ridiculously useful to just have an endpoint where you can see if that thing is running or not. Um, also, what you can do is have this. It's basically just a monitoring page. What does your application connect to? Well, we're using Redis. We're using also Memcache for some reason. Uh, we're also connecting to database. So have this page where all these connections are there. So um, they can be plugged into whatever monitoring tool, and people can actually see, well, there's a problem even reported from the application side. Obviously, these are irrelevant if you do not monitor them. Another thing I want to shortly touch upon is alerts. Um, these normally do not come to developer, there, but there are cases when they do. And what most developers do is ignore them. It's like, ah, somebody's taking care of that. Most of the time, nobody's taking care of that. So if you have this option, look into it, go to a to your operations team, or a guy, or a girl, or what have you, and um, 
make sure somebody actually is working on it. And if there is nobody working on it, you can work on it. Another interesting thing that developers tend to do is use email filters. They're not big fans of emails, but they are fans of email filters. So whenever you have like a short outage or something, and people get like a thousand emails, developers just go, yeah, move them to monitoring, mark this red. If you do that, they're irrelevant. So you should be better off uh, without having alerts. And now that we've figured out how to basically spot the problem in terms of monitoring, um, the next logical step is to actually fix it and figure out why it happens. And here comes logging. Who here actually puts a lot of thought into logging and has a proper logging infrastructure and such? That's scary. Okay, so first of all, out of the box, everybody has logging, right? Logging is really, really simple. Uh, it boils down to just having um, some events logged to a disk somewhere. Th that's logging in its essence. So it's fairly easy to set up, um, fairly easy to maintain, I would say, and everybody kind of has it under, uh, out of the box. Um, you have the kernel logs, you have PHP logs, you have um, web server logs. Actually, this is one that comes from Nginx. I stripped it down just to fit the slide, but it actually comes with a whole bunch of more information. Um, What's relevant about um, these particular things is that if you look at them as they are, they're not very meaningful. I mean, you get a whole bunch of good information, like status codes, like request path, and stuff like that, but uh, you can also um, do a little bit more with it. Uh, also, if you cannot read like really, really fast screens, there's this little tool, it's called Nginx Top, it does that for you. It basically reads and uh, aggregates information. So, logging is basically about perspective. Logging only works if you actually uh, get the data and if you basically put it uh, into something that you can graph it and you can see things um, over time. It's about pattern recognition, and it's about spotting uh, what's outside of your normal patterns of usage. So it actually has a lot of uh, use cases when we're talking about logging. First one that comes to mind is obviously detecting errors. It's really, really easy to go in your uh, web server and see, well, there are a lot of 500s, something is wrong. And going back to my previous statement, even if you don't have logging, maybe your framework does something for you, so you can check that. Uh, maybe uh, there's something with the hardware, so you can check the kernel log. Or maybe it's just something like a PHP federal exception, uh, which you can actually see within the PHP logs. So you still have some um, use case without even having proper logging. Another thing you can use it for is forensics. And this sounds very CSI kind of thing. It's not about magnifying and reversing some shade in somebody's sunglasses to figure out the license plate, no. This is just um, a way to use logs to figure out what happened. So for example, if you get a ticket saying customer were complaining at 5 a.m. that they couldn't log in. Um, you look at monitoring, there was nothing at 5 a.m. Um, you look at the uh, logging dashboards that you have and you figure out there was a network outage. It was actually a plain maintenance, so we didn't have any alerts for it. But just going to the logs and seeing that, oh, there was a problem, did it fix? Yes. Are we actually uh, tracking the customer logins? We might be or we might not be. But if people do not complain, then you can just close the ticket without actually doing any work on it. Um, now, you know how Everybody says do not trust your users. They're kind of right on that one, unfortunately. So there are cases where you can use uh, logging to figure out misuse of application. Uh, misuse of application is not necessarily hacking. It can be um, as far as somebody just doing something you weren't expecting to do, or it can be something uh, downright evil. Um, a while ago, I was uh, trying to figure out how to do URL shortening. And as you figure out in all the talks at this conference and all conferences, it just reuse what's there. So I went to Packagist, and there was something. Problem solved. It, it was lovely. But as I mentioned, I'm also responsible for whatever goes into production, so I had to do due diligence. 
Um, apparently, that particular package was doing a lot of checks on the URLs you provided. And it allowed me to do stuff like that, which is port scanning. It's nice, right? In the meantime, I notified the author and that was fixed. But again, we do not expect that. Is it malicious or not? Who knows? I mean, it could be or not. Um, obviously, you have um, this default use case when somebody just tried to delete every single ID. Um, it might work, it might not work, but looking at the logs, you basically figure out that somebody tried to do it. Um, you can retrace their steps and see if they were actually successful in doing anything. Or um, if it just was a false alarm, but still you have something to go on. Um, another important thing is security, obviously. Uh, if you have not so friendly users, um, they will have this tendency to try and hack you. And in terms of security, there's the obvious SQL injections and stuff like that, but we're not going to cover it because we filter input and escape output so we're safe. But um, script kiddies will still try. There are like a thousand million uh, tools that do that. Um, and it's not very fun, but it still raises alarms at some point. So you could see stuff like this into your logs. It, Quite useful, I would say. You can just um, copy those things, put them into whatever you have as security audit, and you can run it against yourself. See, uh, guys are good. Another thing you can actually do in terms of security and why logs are important is that if somebody is actually after you, there's a real good chance they will hack you sooner or later. It sounds bad, but it's actually true. Either being by social engineer, or either being by an ops dude sleeping and not updating Nginx in time, or things like that. Um, those logs do provide a lot of meaningful information on how you got hacked. Even if it's social engineering, having the entire log um, of what happened and being able to replay to figure out what the user was doing and uh, where, did he, where did the attack come from, helps a lot. Um, also helps a lot with DDoS attacks. So we can just go, look at the logs, figure out is the entire Amazon ban AWS. Um, logs are, while checking the logs, you will also find stuff like indicators that things are going poorly. This doesn't mean necessarily that um, you have errors or the service is not available. It's just poorly. So, Back to that Nginx log I showed you. Um, just a little bit of Nginx configuration and you can get response size, you can get the server um, response time. And we actually had this case. We deployed an application, it went through all sorts of random checks and quality assurance process and yada, yada, yada. But when we were looking at the logs for that particular page, it was like 15% higher, and nobody could explain it. So we went at it, we went, well, view source. There was a var dump, but it was in a hidden span. Like, nobody saw it because it was hidden. Nobody actually tracks for that within our um, deployment tools, so it just went by. Also, whenever response time grows by a lot, it's an indicator that you're doing something wrong. So if you deploy your page and you figure out that after deployment, it's like 20% higher, that means you probably have something unperformant in that piece of code that you deployed. So you can just go in and revisit it and fix it without things escalating. Because if you leave code like that and you add stuff on top of it um, every single day, you're gonna have a really, really bad day. Um, and the last one is key metrics going well, wrong or off, depends. Back to the customers. Um, we said three per hour is decent, right? If it's less than three per hour, we should uh, send out an alert. There are hours where customers do not actually register based on your time zone. Like, you won't have at 5 a.m. three people registering to your website. That, that's just absurd. Um, and this does not necessarily imply that you have errors of any sort. It's just pretty much something is off with your system. And logging um, can actually help you spot all those things. Um, here's an interesting one, performance. Logs can actually be useful for performance testing or even spike testing. Like, um, 
Not everybody can afford the really expensive toys. Those uh, things that do, like the shiny load balancers that do mirroring traffic and sending 20% of the traffic to your lab environment, those are really, really, really expensive. Because they're good, but they're still expensive. So what you can do is actually take your access logs and you can fast forward them. And then you can literally generate traffic on whatever environment you want. The incredible advantage to that is that you're not hitting one URL 25,000 times. That's mostly relevant. You're actually generating the same natural traffic that your, user, your users are generating on your website whenever they come and visit. And that's something that's really, really good. Um, if you want to take it further, you can take all the logs from like two weeks and compress them and just fire them in like two hours. And then you stress test everything, everything, including your network. So uh, what should we expect from logs? Like, what makes a decent logging system? Well, first things first is that they have to be available, right? Um, when I say available, I'm not referring to just being able to see them somewhere. They have to be aggregated from the entire stack. If you have 20 application servers, you don't want to trace logs on every single server. But what you do want to have is something where they're all in the same place and you can do whatever you want on the entire aggregating result. One thing that's really, really, really important is that availability only refers to reading. Do not let people manipulate your logs. Like, we're all engineers and we always have the best intentions, but sometimes there's a slight amount of temptation and people are pretty good at messing up things. So they will do, what they will do is go in and basically purge the logs. You do not want to have that happening. It's, it's not good. Second thing we expect from it is persistence. Persistence is really, really important because, well, you want to have the logs there. Um, there are a lot of logging libraries, frameworks, what have you. Um, they're doing one thing wrong, though. They provide all these handlers for you to write to Mongo, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, whatever you want. Please don't do that. You're going to basically DDoS yourself. If you want to get a DDoS, let somebody at least pay for it. Don't do it yourself. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that you do have network outages between your production and whatever logging environment. So if that actually happens, you're not able to transport any logs because you're just doing it over the wire. No, save stuff to disk. Then have services that do collecting of logs. My personal favorite is FluentD but you can use whatever you want, like Logstash, which is, uh, another popular <laughs> which is another popular way of um, visualizing logs, has its own collector, so you can use those. Uh, if you want to speed up things, um, you can also use stuff like uh, partitions mounted in RAM, you can use SSDs, and so on. Well, they shouldn't affect the user. Th this is quite straightforward, right? You don't want to basically bottleneck your entire machine with logs while the user cannot click. So I did this. This is basically vanilla Symfony, just a default controller. Here on the bottom you have the numbers of messages I log. The message is hello world. And that line there, amazingly enough, it's not the Volkswagen stocks lately, it's the throughput. And the line at the bottom, it's basically the um, request millisecond, the request time. So as you can see, it actually has quite an impact. Obviously, this was run on a shitty machine with absolutely no proper setup. And this test is not relevant as you see it, but it does affect your performance. So make sure you do think about what you're logging. It's really, really important. If you're doing transactions of any sort, do not log every single step in a different message. Just aggregate that information and log one message. It's way more efficient. Um, obviously, they should be easy to read and visualize. So um, for this, it's pretty simple. Just use one of the tools out there. There are a lot. You have Grafana, you have Logstash, you have Zabbix, you have Cocti. Whatever you like, whichever you think is the shiniest, use that. Um, Two words of advice, though. Use something that supports annotations. This is basically that line in the middle of the graph that says, here something happened. That's really, really important because you can actually compare data. 
from the left side to the right side. Other than that, to each its own. So what should we actually log? Um, it actually says there, when, where, where, who, who, what. It's when did it happen? Obviously, the date of the, and the time of the incident. Um, a lot of people, uh, and I've read it on a lot of blogs, which I don't agree to, it's everybody says, use timestamps. They're magical. Apparently, those people have never been DDoSed. That's when your logging infrastructure is useless. You cannot rely on it because nothing works. Everything is bottlenecked. So you actually need to go to the server. It's really, really fun when you actually see timestamps because your brain is perfectly wired to transform timestamps into reading formats. Um, the disadvantage to that is uh, to using um, something that's readable is obviously you have a bit more characters, but people are logging a lot. A few bytes here and there. Hmm. Um, also use an international format. Don't rely on whatever the user, don't rely on whatever is the server. Use something like GMT, Central European, or whatever. Um, you have to log where did it happen. Like, what was the application where this happened? Um, what was the version of the application where it happened? Um, who was, uh, what was the cluster in which we were, the host name, things like that. All those things are really, really relevant for you to log because it kind of uh, helps you spot the problem. It, it can be the fact that one machine in your entire cluster of 6,000 servers is failing. You don't want to spend time debugging your application when there is that one machine. So you need to know where this actually happens. The next a question you need to ask yourself is, who did it happen to? Um, get the source address of the client. If only if your customers agree to it in the privacy and policy, get the cell tower ID. <laughs> um, it's really useful for mobile devices. Um, and if you have any sort of trace about um, the user's identity, if he's logged in or not, things like that, also log that. It will help you a lot. Um, and obviously, you need to log what happened. It's like all that information is irrelevant otherwise. The only thing I want to touch upon on this slide is the severity of the event. You need to have a very, very, very clear strategy where everybody is on board, like operations, QA, development, everybody. You need to define them. Like Monolog, for example, provides you with uh, stuff from debugging all the way to critical, I think. Um, it might be the case that we decide that critical is whenever that happens, somebody needs to intervene. Guess what happens if an ops guy has to wake up at 3 a.m. for you because you were just debugging with critical? He's not going to like you. I, I tell you that for a fact. So this is all theory, but what exactly do we log? So um, if you're doing anything that requires PCI compliance and real PCI compliance, not the PCI certified kind of logo, uh, that's like 800 euros and you don't have to do anything for it. Um, log everything related to customers. Like, when did he log in? Was he successful? How many times did he attempt it? Uh, did he actually try to reset his password or not? That gives you a lot of information. For example, you can distinguish fairly well between um, an attack like the dude tried to log in three times and then he went reset password, I forgot it. Or if you see that you only have um, failed login attempts, somebody's actually trying to brute force into your system. So that's not really, really good. Um, log unexpected results. Whenever something fails, log it. Um, but also log expected results. And this is very, very important. A lot of people don't do this. Um, the expected results is, um, Kind of hard to explain why you log. It's like it worked, right? Uh, the thing is that every now and then you might have this gut feeling that it might not perform well, right? Add some logging there. Add some metrics. It's like um, we have a new vendor. We did not work with these guys. We do not know what they do. Uh, it works, but let's add some logging information to see how fast they respond. Do, do they have a steady response line? Can we trust them? If they, are, they prove themselves to be trustworthy, then you can just remove that information. Um, but it's really, really good to have it. The metrics we covered, obviously, log them. And configuration changes. Uh, I'm going to touch upon that a, a bit later. 
So, uh, but not too long. See, scary Lego. Um, nothing that's basically um, information that you wouldn't want exposed. So, source code, no. First of all, it's relevant because it's probably going to be modified over time. Anything session related, you might say, well, it's, it's a session ID, who cares? If somebody gets a hold of, of your logs, they might a, be able to do um, session prediction based on the patterns they have from you. So you don't want that to happen. Obviously, all sorts of customer information. If you really hate your uh, company a lot um, and you're broke, do bank account. Um, other, don't do it. So um, next few minutes, I'm, I want to go over some tips and tricks for free-ish. Um, and mostly things that I've learned. Logging is part of your application. So logging, if you're using a logging framework, it runs with your code. It can actually break production because you did something wrong with uh, logging. That means you also have to test it. It's not enough to just write uh, this container get logger quit or what have you. You really need to test it and make sure those calls actually happen. It, it's important. Um, obviously, use a framework. Do not roll your own. It makes absolutely no sense. Monolog is really, really nice. It does pretty much everything out of the box for you. You don't have to do anything. Another important point is that you need to refactor the logging as your application matures. When you release a new feature to production, you might want to have a lot of logging merely for the fact that you do not know how it's going to uh, perform. So once you figure out it works as expected, then you can just reduce the logging. Again, logging affects performance. You don't want to have that. Um, the next one is have a company-wide strategy. And this is a bit more complex because it actually means that you as developers or dev leads or what have you, you have to talk to business people. That's always fun. So the log levels we did cover a little bit. Logging channels. You have a whole wide variety of um, severity levels that you touch upon. Not all of them are crucial to your application. Like debug information, you might not want to pay too much attention to it. You can actually have it with a very low priority when you collect data, where you can have a totally different strategy in terms of how long you're going to keep that data. But it's really, really important that whenever you um, discuss this with people, you have an agreement. Good or bad, everybody needs to be on board a bit. Uh, the biggest problem with logs is that nobody looks at them. So um, generally speaking, people only look at logs when stuff breaks. Logs are actually also reason to, you know, to gloat and show off. It's like, look, performance, improvement. You can put it in shiny reports. So have somebody look at the logs daily. If there is not, nobody that actually wants to do it, just rotate between your developers. Um, this one is my favorite, actually. Uh, we had this legacy application that at some point started going wrong. Um, we had a lot of alerts for it. And when we checked the logs, it said, cannot find user in database. That's it. We did not know. Is, is everybody affected? Is a user affected? Apparently, there was just somebody hitting old links like mad. That wasn't a problem, but we could have spotted that out without spending ridiculous amounts of time. Um, obviously, think of what you log. Logging is expensive. It's really, really useful, but it affects, um, it affects you directly. Your code base grows, which you don't want. Performance is affected, which you don't want. If you are unsure if you want to log something or not, just go peer review. It's like, hey, dude, I want to log this stuff. Do you think it's relevant? And he'll say, I'm not sure. If you're not sure, you can add this later. It's not the biggest problem. Like, PDMs will approve it. It's all good. Um, Track the user through all your services. So nowadays you have web servers, application servers, Redis, uh, all sorts of uh, front-end caches, all sorts of data storages. You need to be able to track the user from the request to the response. You need to know where he went, what he did, what APIs did you call on his behalf, what did those APIs respond. Um, there are a lot of uh, services that do this for you out of the box, like AppDynamics does it. Uh, and New Relic, they're both commercial. Um, but you can also implement it yourself. 
you can actually use the session ID but tokenized for this kind of use cases. So then you would just go into your logging infrastructure, you would search for whatever token, and you will see exactly what the user did. Um, do not trust, trust third-party vendors ever, not even Google or Facebook or whomever. They all fail. It's really important to log what happens because it also helps them. When you call your third-party vendor and say, something is horribly broken, they will say, okay, we'll check. If you call them and you say, dude, on the last 10 API calls, we got this response, he will literally just redirect you to the technical team. And those guys actually know what you're talking about. Um, log or annotate anything that's a system change. When you deploy code, do logging. When you change configuration, do logging. When you clear caches, do logging. We had a bug, we fought with it for three days, nobody can figure it out. It just went out of the blue. Nobody figured out why. Until somebody said, I cleared all the Redis caches, I, I did flush all. So obviously it was something in Redis, but we'll never know. Um, store logs for a decent amount of time. Like, if you store them for like two days, they're irre irrelevant. Um, logs are data over time. The more data you have, the easier it is to see the patterns into them. Um, and the last thing, prioritize um, how you collect the logs. As I mentioned, not everything is equally important. When you're critical for something, that's important. If I'm doing uh, debugging on a production server somewhere but at the end of the world, nobody cares. Uh, this is pretty much it. If you have questions. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes, right? Questions? Nobody? I have one. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, when you said earlier uh, not to use timestamps time because they are not readable, uh, I assume you meant Unix timestamps? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That there? Can you suggest any tool for analyzing clocks? Because logging is not the biggest problem, analyzing is bigger. Analyzing in terms of what, like for security, for to example, if you want to see like... To find uh, some events that we are not expecting to occur in the logs, for example. So there is, uh, for example, for security, there is an open source tool called OSSEC um, that does that for you. Um, there are quite a few, um, but they're really targeted at stuff like web servers, so there isn't something generic that does all this pattern matching for you. Um, Splunk does it to some extent, but it's really expensive for uh, smaller companies. If you're like a really big company, uh, Splunk is the way to go. It actually comes with a lot of good features. Why do you have uh, so harsh opinion uh, uh, for logging in DB, for example, Mongo? I, I don't have a harsh opinion about logging in Mongo. You can log in whatever data source you want. My harsh opinion is directly uh, logging over the wire. So whenever you log something, you store it to disk, that's the least expensive operation that you can actually do, and then have something collect the logs and put them to whatever data source you choose. The problem is that once you actually do it real time, so you basically connect to Mongo and send the data, you're using a lot of uh, the network that's meant for the customers. You do not want to affect your customers with the, your internal traffic as much as possible. Um, also, when you do it um, like that, every single message you basically connect to Mongo. Um, tools that actually collect logs do that in batches. So they just go in, they take 30 messages, they push them to Mongo. You basically do it one by one, and you're abusing um, a lot of connections. You're, you might end up without uh, file handlers and things like that. Yeah, but uh, here is the dilemma, uh, disk versus uh, network. Disk you can go around. SSDs really, really got cheaper nowadays, and you can always have a mounted um, virtual disk within your memory. It, it all depends on your strategy. If, if you're running a bank, then I do understand. You might even go as far as using TCP for logging, because you're running a bank. 
if you can afford losing some of the logs, you can just log right straight up to memory. Doesn't get faster than that. And then have it collected and pushed into Mongo. It's literally just a couple of seconds difference in real time. Welcome. Anybody else? Yes. Hi. Um, any su suggestions for logging uh, multiple workers and stuff like that? How to aggregate them in the same way? So I don't have like instance of thousand workers, so I don't have thousand logs, but like on one place and how to handle that? It, it depends on the kind of data you're using, like. Elasticsearch, for example, does that out of the box for you. It does aggregation on, uh, on streams. But based on the data types, um, you can use a solution that does that. Ryak has some support for it, but it's not ideal. Um, otherwise, you, it, it's very, very dependent to your use case. So we can just talk in the lobby. Thanks. Anybody else? Then thank you very much.